consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. For the second time on the What is Asia podcast, I talked to Tom Fisher, a former MA student at the University of Oregon's Asian Studies Department, to talk about the US, China, and the future of Asian studies. Tom, welcome back to uh, the What is Asia podcast. The first time I can say welcome back. Well, it's a pleasure to be back, Nakoda. Thanks for having me on again. So um, there, there's, there's a lot that I want to discuss here. So for uh, just to cue people in, we're just going to kind of do like a year in review, talk about the podcast, talk about uh, just sort of like our general thoughts on where Asian studies is going, where, where history is going in terms of, um, you know, you know, faculty and just sort of the situation in terms of funding and all that stuff. And just sort of about uh, talking about things that are happening in popular discussion, issues involving China, Taiwan, to a lesser extent, you know, Japan uh, have started to bubble up more in popular conversation. Tom and I are going to uh, go over that. And uh, so let's just kind of start with, um, I guess, in that direction, um, in, in popular conversation, Tom, it's, it seems like there, there's been kind of a, um, you know, a rise in, in, I guess, what we call like armchair experts uh, who you know, seem, seem to have all the answers when it comes to issues of China and Taiwan. And, um, you know, this isn't to say like, you know, you or I want to like stamp out, you know, conversation or, or discourage people from like thinking critically about it. But it, 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 it seems to me, you know, and this is almost kind of why I started the podcast. It seems to me like, you know, when you watch like Fox or CNN or something, uh, some political pundit comes on, you know, who speaks very authoritatively. It's like, well, this is the answer. This, you know, this is the way we need to approach this issue. And, and the thing is like the, the, the community of China historians, it's not that big, you know? And so it's like, I would say that I, I, I'm pretty familiar with like who, who most of the people are in the field. Uh, and then I'll see these people on like Fox or CNN or MSNBC. I'm like, who the hell are these people? You know, and you look them up and it turns out that they're like a journalist who like, you know, 20 years ago did some, uh, foreign affairs writing for the New York times on China. And so like that qualifies them as an expert, you know, I, I mean, what, what, I guess, what is your take on that? Like what, how have you been thinking about that? Um, you know, especially as, as like, you know, in the past few years, China and Taiwan has, has come up in more popular discussion. Well, it's an interesting point. And I think the first way I want to talk about this is I want to break down the different type of experts you see with these, with these sorts of things. Because one, you have, you know, the pundits. And the pundits seek other pundits because that's how you get a conversation going. And so on these news programs, they look for other journalists since they say, oh, I worked at the Beijing Bureau for the New York Times. And so I can tell you this, 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 and this about local governance in Shanxi. Maybe this person knows something about local governance in Shanxi. I, I don't know all the particulars, but it becomes one of those things where I have this tangential credential and therefore I can speak about something that maybe isn't in my wheelhouse really. Or like I was, I was in China and like, 1995 and you know i was really close with Zhu Rongji. and so let me tell you about how politburo works now you know there's a claim there the claim isn't necessarily invalid but it's also being stretched to the point where it's kind of it's losing its value it's not really as useful for making an authoritative decision or making a well-informed opinion as whatever news program would like you to believe and that, I think, has a lot to do with just the general media environment in the United States. Our side is right. We have the experts to prove it, you know? And they will weaponize certain facts and certain opinions. And these pundits come on with the cherry-picked facts, with the cherry-picked opinions. And, you know, 
next segment. Oh, there's been a there's been a bus crash in California or something. Oh no. <laughs> I was the other side to blame for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, 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 not, it's not partisan, right? <laughs> it's not yeah. has to do with it, but that's the environment. Uh, that's the first thing I think about these, um, the pundits you see on the news or in the papers sometimes. But there's a different category, I think. And that's the more relevant experts. Like I was listening to this program I, I don't know why I listen to this program. It's it's this program out of Hawaii. It's like a local news thing. And I honestly don't know why I listen to it so often. But I find myself listening to it very often. And they had um, they had a naval officer, like a fairly high-ranking naval officer, talking about China's Navy, or just the general Hawaiian audience. You know, this wasn't like a, a, a foreign policy show. This is like a general local program. They talk about... You know, condo rent. They talk about local politics in Oahu. They talk about those sorts of things. And they were talking to this guy who worked at the naval station at Pearl Harbor. He was an officer. And he was talking about the evolution of China's Navy. And so they had, the moderator was, you know, I, I assume probably a communication student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa or something. And she was doing a fine job. And he was doing a fine job talking about the Navy. But this is one of those things where it's not, it's, it's interesting analysis, but it's also lacking the specificity that you'd really need for a, a good analysis. That's, that goes partly into this divide between academia and the general public is that the, the professors, the researchers have time, they have resources. And they can find the specifics. But by then, people have already moved on. You know, the news media has moved on to the next topic. And people don't care anymore once you have the actual answer. Mm -hmm. And that's and as much as there can be an actual answer to things. Or same thing, especially with military matters. Who has the best information? The intelligence services. And they're not sharing it with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, to, to, to pull the conversation into a slightly different direction, like another thing that uh, I guess kind of concerns me when I think about this topic of, um, you know, having like pundits on China or people like that is that, you know, when, when, when China is discussed in, you know, the, these media sites or, or even on, you know, major social media platforms like, you know, different podcasts and things like that. It seems like the opinions that are sought out tend to be from people who study China in the political science arena and, and less so in the history field. Like in my experience, and, and I don't want to say named here specifically because, you know, who knows, maybe I'll still get invited to speak with them one day. But I've, you know, I've reached out to uh, different uh, local politicians, a couple of national politicians and, and said like, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to engage with you in, you know, a conversation about China. I have a degree in, uh, you know, Asian studies, Chinese history. And, you know, either I've been pretty promptly shot down by their secretaries or I just never got a response back from them. And, and it, it seems like, you know, based on my experience, but also what I've observed in general, it's it seems like people from the history field don't ever really get a place uh, in the conversation. Um, I, I was also watching uh, this program and I don't mean any disrespect to these people. I mean, I, I actually do like their program. It's called Breaking Points. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to, to I listen. I've had the chance, no. Yeah, I mean, they're actually a really good news program. I really do like listening to them. But I remember they were having a segment on, on Taiwan at one point and they were talking about you know, should the U.S. defend Taiwan or not? And the two people that they had on to have this debate were, were two people. I think one person is, you know, works for some national security team. Another person was like a journalist or something like that. And it's like, okay, it's a good debate. Obviously, these people are well informed, but there's no one who's bringing in the more historical perspective to this conversation. And one thing that kind of frustrates me is that it, it, it seems like, and, and I'm going to generalize here, I'm not saying that all people from the political sciences are like this, but it seems to be the case when I talk to a lot of people from the political sciences that 
anything before 1949 doesn't matter, basically, when you have a conversation with them. Or if, if they're, you know, if they're very adventurous, maybe they'll go back to 1912. But it, it seems to me like when you have conversations with a lot of these people, it, it's like it's like anything before 1912 might as well have not even happened. And it's like, you know, it, it's you're really missing a lot of opportunity to get a true eye into what China is or, or more specifically the CCP is thinking about their place in the world and in, in the future. You know, something that I've, I think I've brought up in a podcast before. But just one example, like when Xi Jinping is talking about Zhongguo Meng, the Chinese dream, that, that's literally a reference to a Tang Dynasty poem. So history plays a lot or, you know, uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative. I just had an episode last week uh, about this, you know, Yi Dai Yi Lu. It's, it's, it's literally a reference to the Silk Roads of pre-modern China. So you know, there, there, there's a place for talking about history and how it informs the way that the CCP sees its place in modern society, but just, and also how it sees its place in the world in general. And how, you know, when I, when I talk to a lot of people too, you know, cause this, 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 uh, uh, this great emphasis, this overemphasis on, on 1949 and above, kind of seeps into the general public's understanding of, of China in the wrong way too, in the sense that I, I've talked to just a lot of people who, uh, you know, they don't really specialize in China. They just sort of hear what they hear on the news and, and, you know, they'll, they'll say things. I, I had a conversation actually just about a week ago with someone who was like, uh, oh, well, you know, Xi Jinping is trying to be the next Mao. And, and, and it's like, if you're a historian of China, you're like, oh, well, hold, hold on. No, no, you know, there's, 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 you know, let's break it down a little bit, right? Yeah. You know, but, but they, they, you know, and it's not necessarily their fault, but they think about that in those terms, because there's this overemphasis on, okay, well, well, now is sort of the beginning of China. Nothing matters before that. And everything is sort of Mao centric until you get to Xi Jinping. And then it becomes Xi Jinping centric, but they're 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 tied together as sort of being one person in a lot of ways, and so you start to develop a lot of misunderstandings about uh, what the CCP wants, what Xi Jinping wants, because people view him in terms of oh well he's just the reincarnation of Mao, and so you know th this is why I feel like um, it's it's critical that we get more historians out there uh, to have a media presence. Uh, not necessarily to push aside the poli sci people, but to have a conversation alongside the poli sci people. So that, that was a really long response to what you were saying, but. I don't know, but I think there's a lot that we can talk about in that response. And one of the things I find interesting about the Mao equation is that it's, it, well, one, this is something you also see in the papers, Lynn. I think that's why this is the comparison people naturally reach to. It's sort of, oh, big, scary, strong man of China. Mao Zedong. Easy. Done. Next. And, you know, Deng Xiaoping and, you know, Jiang Zemin, all these people were very big in their own time. But they were, weren't the same sort of figures. You know, they were a member of the party, and the party did not revolve around them the same way that it apparently revolves around C. And so I think that's part of it. But part of it is it's just historical shorthand. It's easy and it's the narrative being put forward in most major major media outlets in the United States. But one thing that I think is more interesting about this whole, you know, 1949 is where China begins, is you see this actually in a lot of countries, you know, with like France, think about France. Why are we on the fifth French Republic? It's because it's a way to disavow the various failures of the fourth republic which was a way to disavow the failures of the third and so on and so forth so now you're at the fifth in the united states we don't really do this but it's pretty common in a lot of countries around the world and that's sort of the way i see the 1949 narrative in china it's oh that was then this is now you know things are different now they're a public who you know terrible practically practically just warlords and bandits and you know, nothing, nothing good going on, nothing worth remembering. But now, you know, we're on the People's Republic and ain't that great. Mm -hmm. And so part of it also comes from China. 
it's the way history is narrated in China and it leaks out here. And so when people go to China, when they learn Chinese history and they talk to Chinese people, they'll often hear, you know, liberation, right? It's before liberation and after liberation. And whatever's before liberation can't be that good, can it? It's a very significant juncture in the, in the historical narrative. And so it's almost natural that this limits the range of, you know, applicable history. One closing remark on that, though, yeah. just before we um, try to go to the next topic. That's also one reason why, you know, when you have pundits and you have these armchair experts, one way to look at it, this goes back to um, a class actually with Brian Goodwin talking about Rong Zhang and the Halliday book on Mao, you know, how Mao was such a terrible person. And the academic response was Mao really a monster. And I was talking about this with my family actually somewhat recently. And on the one hand, there was a concern among the academics that people were reading this book and this would be the Mao book they read and they would never read anything else and say, oh, and now these people have a completely false image of Mao Zedong or a completely distorted image of Mao Zedong and they won't understand what's going on. They've essentially been lied to and they're not gonna figure that out. And they've been fooled. Well, my father was actually saying, another way of looking at it is the more discussion you have, the more people who come across Mao Zedong, the more people who come across the armchair experts, the more people will be interested and say, hmm, you know, what's actually the deal with that? Let me look into this for myself. And so the proliferation of armchair experts is, well, one, it's a sign that this is an important topic in people's minds. And it's also probably a, an encouraging development, I think. It means more people will be looking into this for their own sake. And we may see the a general increase in the amount of interest of, of Americans in East Asia and China and history. Well, you know, and it sort of leans into the next topic that I wanted to go into, which is sort of like, how do historians effectively reach across the, this academic, uh, you know, you know, wired fence it seems to the, the the general public because you know what, one thing that I talk about you know with uh, a lot of podcast guests like we'll have like off camera conversations and one thing I say to them is like if you look at someone like you know Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye or, or Michio Kaku uh, you know they, they've taken what could easily have been like a on the surface seem like a very bland subject you know, it's like astronomy, the stars. And yes, there's there's a sort of certain wonder in, in looking up at the sky. But I think that sense of wonder was really well developed by people like, like the three that I had just mentioned. And, 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 you know, it seems to me like we in the history or in the Asian studies community, I, I mean, there, there's people like Dan Carlin, but, but we really don't have anyone of the same caliber as, as like Neil deGrasse Tyson, where it's like, he says he's going to do a speaking engagement at, you know, um, you know, some convention center here in LA and like, you know, it, it immediately sells out like an hour after tickets go up on sale. Like we don't have that guy in the Asian studies world yet. And so I, I guess, what do you think about how we can get, I guess, that, that type of figurehead for, for our field, especially as there is a greater interest in talking about East Asia, particularly China. So, I mean, there's a couple of things uh, I'd like to say to that. And the first is, and we can talk more about alternatives. You don't necessarily need a superstar to sell the product, but we can talk about that in a moment. First, let's, let's entertain, let's entertain, how do you build the Asian studies superstar? How do you get a Neil deGrasse Tyson? How do you get a Bertrand Russell type of person? And, you know, someone who's going to be renowned through the country, people will stand in the rain to go to, to, go to a speech, right? You know, it's kind of hard to believe that people will be um, storming Barnes & Noble for the next academic treatise on, uh, I don't know, silk production in the Sui Dynasty, you know, or, you know, the digging of the Grand Canal. But maybe they will be. You know, the Grand Canal is actually a very interesting topic and that it's very, it's very relevant to many challenges facing China today. And, and maybe and, we can talk about that in a moment. 
Yeah. And I think even if you take something as mundane as like, you know, I, I don't know, you know, agriculture and the Tang dynasty or the grand canal or something like that. If, if you get the right person who has sort of like a, almost like the talent of a fiction writer to like create the sense of wonder in thinking about that, you know, you, I'm sure you can cultivate a superstar that way, but, but anyway, go, go ahead. Well, that's actually, it's interesting that you mentioned the talent of a fiction writer. Because that goes to Pearl Buck, right? How did Pearl Buck get people to care about China? It was through fiction. Or I went to, um, I participated in a, a conference. It was a remote conference, which is you know, somewhat less exciting than an in-person conference, but at the University of Hawaii. And there was a professor talking about a superstar, not necessarily a superstar, but a star. You know, she was famous in Hawaii. Uh, Lily Lee, I think her name was. She was an actress and she... And this guy, Ray Scott, made a very famous documentary called Kugan, you know, bitterness in Chinese, or the feeling of bitterness. And this documentary was so timely. It was 1942. It was about life in Chongqing during the war. FDR watched it and wrote a personal address to the people of Chongqing, talking about the movie he had just watched and how, you know, the American people are with them, and, you know, our thoughts are with you, and we will, we are fighting on your side, that sort of thing. And, but you'll notice with the to bring China into the forefront, there are other considerations, right? One, you have a world war. And Pearl Buck is sort of related to that. You had all sorts of unrest in China, it was leaking out. And you had people responding through arts and fiction. They weren't responding through the writing of academic history. They were using history, but not necessarily in an academic form. So what do you think about that? Is it more effective to reach out through arts? Or is there something to be said for the history superstar selling out the Staples Center? Yeah, well, I, I think I think one way to possibly cultivate that superstar could be through the arts. Because, you know, another thing that I've talked about, again, off camera with a lot of my guests is the fact that, you know, I think about... Um, Jurassic Park a lot. I remember I was watching an interview with this one paleontologist and he was saying that, uh, I think Jurassic Park came out in 1994. He was saying that, you know, before Jurassic Park, you know, dinosaurs were this like really nerdy kind of thing. Like, you know, no one was really touching that subject. And he said that, you know, when he was teaching undergraduate classes on dinosaurs, it's like, yeah, you know, there were some people who were uh, coming to his class with, with an interest. Um, but he said after Jurassic Park came out, it, it, in, it, it incited such, uh, you know, a wonder, such a, a, an amazement with the world of paleontology that he said, like, the very next year that he taught that class, there was just gobs of people who were lining up to, to, to be in that class. And so, you know, like, another thing that we can think about it for history, for example, is Hamilton. I'm actually going to go see that play in about a month. Um, you know, it, 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 that I think really, um, invigorated a resurgence in interest in early American history, which I think is something that's great because, you know, I talked to some historians of the U S and there seems to be like an oversaturation of people who want to study the 20th century because of a fear that like, oh, you know, if it's not the 20th century, I'm not relevant to the current, uh, political discussions here in the U S um, but I, I think I think plays like Hamilton have have invigorated that um, that desire to go to places that are that are seen as less shredded. Um, and so you know, and then if you, even if you think about someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, he did uh, you know a bunch of different documentaries on on space. I can't think of the name of it right now. Michio Kaku, obviously Bill Nye, the science guy. We all grew up with him. Um, and so you know, using that 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 art medium can can really help us and I, I mean you know Chinese you know I, I guess to, to 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 speak simplistically China has technically existed for 3,000 years if, if we're going to go by a very very surface level understanding of China right. there's 3,000 years of history that you could pull from I, you know I mean some things that that stand out to me in particular is like you know Empress Cixi who you know had manipulated her son into not essentially not taking yes. the throne so that she could be the ruler herself that's interesting the boxer rebellion is interesting you know if you want to go back earlier um you know you could talk about 
you know, I don't know, uh, the An Lushan Rebellion. That's interesting. Like there, there's so many stories that you could pull from and make, uh, you know, if you, if you get a really good director to make a movie about one of those uh, events in Chinese history, you absolutely could, uh, you know, incite a resurgence in interest or, or maybe not even a resurgence in the U.S., but, but a first-time interest among an American audience to study some of these periods and perhaps make a superstar out of that. And, and, and I sort of place emphasis on this idea of like creating a single superstar or, or a few superstars, because I, I feel like if the public has like a person that they can grapple onto, um, it's, it's, it'll be easier in the long term to sort of um, keep the general public engaged. Because, you know, if you make a movie, it's like, okay, that's great. But you know, after a couple of years, people have kind of forgotten about it. Now they're looking forward to the next Marvel movie. But if, if, if we have like a Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's constantly doing like tours and writing books and stuff like that, there, there's this constant stream of interest that's being generated by this person or, the, or this group of people. It's interesting to think about the superstar and the context of the personality cults, I think. Because when you're just saying that it made me think of the debates in the Communist Party. But what to do about the Chiang Kai-shek personality cult? And of course, the answer was to make a cult a personality for Mao Zedong. And we're still talking about him to this day. And so in a sense, yes, it's very effective. But the thing about superstars, you know, fighting superstars with superstars, is they're subject to human foibles in human mythology. And so when you have someone like Mao, or you have someone like Ho Chi Minh, you have the apparatus of the states behind them. You know, the apparatus of a propaganda department shaping the figure. And but the you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you have a marketing agency behind him creating the public image of Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know, this is not a, a secret. This is, this is entertainment. You know, this is show business, right? And so it's not just the person. It's the efforts put into that person to present them as a superstar. And they need to live up to it. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, little embarrassing things like, oh, Tiger Woods. Yeah. He ends up with the uh, drunk driving thing. You know, people don't want to talk about too much. Or you have mm -hmm. you know, even these very normal things, right? This, this sort of thing happens all the time. But when it happens with a superstar, it's scandalous. Like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. How could Tiger Woods do that? It's... If your neighbor down the, down the street did, you'd be like, oh, that's bad. <laughs> you wouldn't give it much thought. I wouldn't shake your worldview. It would have dissuade you from gardening or something if your neighbor liked to garden. But that's something in particular about the supers I think we need to think about. Is that when you put all your eggs in this basket, it has the potential to have a lot of sticking power if you put the right efforts into it. But I don't know if you have the institutional capacity to really engineer a superstar for Asian studies or Chinese history in particular. Whereas with arts, you know, these fleeting films, right? Sure, they're fleeting, but they also exercise a power over the imagination. Like Farewell My Concubine, you know, Ba Wang Bie Ji. Mm -hmm. This movie was a smash hit. People still know this movie. If you ask people, who were watching movies in the 90s. You know, they still know Ba Wang Bie Ji. And, and I want to interject yeah. too, because uh, I actually just remembered now The Last Emperor, I think, won an Academy Award for Best Picture in the 1980s. That it did. Oh, that. <laughs> or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was an enormous box office success. It was one, the most successful foreign movie, I think, ever released in the United States. And so there is an interest in China. I, this is a long-standing interest, I think. I don't think there's anything new particularly about it. It changes with time. But in the, in the sense of translating this interest into China, into spurring a more intellectual curiosity into China and Chinese history, that's sort of where the, where the difficulty is. And I think with the superstar, if you could somehow, it was once again with, with Bill Nye in particular, the kids watch Bill Nye. And so we think about, oh, you know, that's so neat because you're kids and it's made to be entertaining. So if, if you get to the kids while they're young, sure. But in schools, we already do that. At least when I was a kid, what we had to do when we were in third grade, we had to do a research project on two countries, 
China and Ghana. And you know, third, it's third grade, so what research can you really do? But you end up learning about China and Ghana. What do people in China eat? Oh, they, they do this. Oh, that's neat. How about Ghana? Oh, okay. Places people hadn't really thought about, especially since you're in third grade. <laughs> but it's, it's planting the seeds, right? It's spurring an interest in the world around you. And maybe that translates to an interest in Chinese history. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, cultivating intellectual curiosity, you, know, you don't know what direction it's going to go. But it's a good thing to do. And so maybe what you start with is you just start with generally encouraging this sort of curiosity in foreign countries. What do you think? Well, I'll, 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 kind of, I'll kind of respond to this while also leaning into the, to the next topic, which is thinking about, you know, yeah, I, I think one way that we can effectively, um, you know, it, at least for me, I still want to place emphasis on this idea of like the superstar, cultivate that superstar is like by creating, uh, you know, children's content, uh, similar to that of Bill Knight, like, and, and we're going to need someone who uh, is willing to like be a little wacky and uh, a little cartoonish because that's obviously what kids are, are going to be attracted to, you know, they're, and, <clears throat> you know, right now it, it seems like, like, okay, like when I was growing up, for example, um, I remember I watched a, uh, a documentary on Asian Egypt when I was in, I think like fifth grade or something. And it was so boring. Like maybe nowadays, if I went back and watched it, I think it's interesting. But as, as a fifth grader, it's, it was just a guy and he had a pointer and he was like pointing at places on the map and he was just talking about them. Like, this is just, you know, it's like, where's Bill Knight? Like I was more excited right. about the science part, you know? Um, and so leading into the next topic, it makes me think like, it, I feel like we need sort of like, a, you know, not necessarily like an R&D department, but, but more, uh, uh, you know, funding in the Asian Studies Department to think about how not just we could do better research, but how we can market that research better. Because I, I do think, you know, and and I don't want to I don't want to create any enemies in in the field when I say this, but I, I do think that there are a lot of people in the Asian Studies and in the history field who you know they 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 uh, you know go through the process of becoming a professor, they get tenure. And then they basically invest all of their time and energy in their research and almost none of their time into public media appearances or, or teaching. Like, you know, there, there are some researchers that are phenomenal researchers, but they're awful professors, you know? And so, you know, it, it makes me think about like, I, I think part of it has to do with a funding issue, like hiring more people in the Asian studies department. And so I, I guess, what do you think about the current funding situation here in the U S for, for Asian studies, um are, are we are we doomed are things going to get better you know what, what what do you think about that so my immediate reaction is we're not doomed it's not looking as good as it was but and this is kind of connected to something i said earlier there's a long-standing interest in china and in asia and the united states and that's <laughs> only reasonable you know it's only reasonable to have an interest in the world around you and even when it wasn't big you still had professors doing research into China and into you know, engaging in old Orientalism, that sort of thing. And so no matter what, I think there will still be professors teaching this. It's just a matter of how many and where. And whether or not there are students, that, there will be some students, maybe not as many as currently. And part of that has to do with demographic change in the U.S. There are fewer children. Part of it has to do with, um, you know, spats with China, you know, the foreign students and the whole visa run. And part of it has to do with the cost of college. How much does it cost to go to school? What are you going to study there? When everyone is telling you studying humanities is like signing up for, you know, a lifetime of poverty and misery. You know, there's not, it's not rosy as well, I'll say to that. But it will still be there. People will still do good research. There will be interested students seeking this sort of thing out. But I'm not sure that it's going to be, it's not going to be like in the 70s or the 80s, unless something changes with the funding situation. But related to what you're talking about, why do a lot of professors buckle down, you know, hunker down on their research? Part of it has to do with the institutional requirements imposed upon them. You know, they need to have a certain amount of research done. They need to help with administrative tasks. 
You know, they need to go to all these meetings. They need to meet with their students. They need to teach their classes. There's not a lot of, it's not a lot of time left. And so when we were at UO, you know, there'd be public lectures. And it was good because people from Eugene would come in, you know, no affiliation with the university beyond they lived in Eugene. And they would come in, they would just listen to the lecture and they would ask questions to the professors. That's good. That's excellent. That we need more things like that. But Zoom, it's very hard to do. Because with that, you would know if you showed up at the library, there would be something going on at some point in the week. And if there was, there'd be a poster who would say, lecture, Friday, 12 o'clock. And if you were already in the library, you'd say, great, I will go to that. Or if you had some time, great, I'll make some time to go see that. And it's very good. But part of it has to do with who has the time and who knows about this, you know, what sort of media circulation is there. And I think what you could do is maybe you have universities setting up like a little fund, right? Setting up some sort of fund for a public lecture in a prominent place in town, a big fanfare, right? Like a monthly lecture series in like Kesey Square or something or some sort of like central part. And you just have a public lecture people go to and they don't, and the, the professor is paid for it and it counts towards something of their work requirements and it's advertised well in advance so people know about it. And that's how you get broader public engagement, I think building off of what we saw with the school lectures. But maybe that's a bit too old fashioned, but I don't know. I think, I think we, we could definitely afford to, um... I don't know what the right word is. I guess like modernize the way that we uh, speak, you know, across the aisle, I guess for lack of a better term to the general public. Like I was having a conversation with a uh, professor that the episode's not going to be out by the time this episode comes out. But um, we, we were talking off camera and I was like, wouldn't it be so cool if we had like a conference where, um, like the centerpiece, like let's say we got like a really famous singer, like, um, I don't know, like Lady Gaga or something, uh, you know, we somehow convinced her to do like a small set for us, like, you know, five songs or whatever. And we made that the centerpiece of this conference. And we said to the general public, like, hey, you can get free tickets to see Lady Gaga, but you get like a punch card. You have to go to at least three lectures you know, and so it's like you sort of like lure people into, uh, you know, going to these conferences and saying like, oh, hey, wait a minute, this is actually kind of interesting, even though their original intention was like, go see this musician. And so I, I you know, I feel like, you know, maybe it's, it's kind of, um, you know, like a far-fetched form of thinking. But, you know, I feel like, again, in the sciences, I mean, they have so much funding. I was, I was talking to someone not long ago who was like, oh yeah, our research projects just got a grant of a million dollars. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, when, in, in Asian studies, when we get a grant, you're talking like $500, you know? So I, I really feel like, like money is a big factor in, in what's going on here. Like if we had more money, we could be a little, we, we could afford to have a little more flair, be a little more extravagant, like people in the sciences. And, and, and it sounds silly for us to say like, oh, hey, let's have Lady Gaga at a Chinese history conference. Right. But, but it's like, they already do that in the sciences. You know, th there are celebrities that, uh, you, you know, will, will go out and, and help sponsor something that Neil deGrasse Tyson is doing. So it's not silly because it's like, they're, they're already doing this in other fields. I, I feel like we should also go out and do that. It's interesting. There's a, you know, my initial reaction is there's something a bit different about Lady Gaga working with Neil deGrasse Tyson than you know, an academic conference. But I think the idea is interesting. How do you get this in the public view? How do you get this in the public mind? But one thing about the sciences, the sciences, you know, these have been sold to, to people relentlessly for the past like 30 years. There's a reason for that. The government wants technology. The government wants weapons. The government wants new energy solutions. They want practical things done. And that's why they're funding this stuff. And okay, it's the federal government's prerogative. They can choose what they fund. But part of it is that the humanities is a low cost discipline in a sense. What do you need? You need people to meet and talk. That's how, that's how business gets done, right? So you have re archival access, you have books, you have documents. You don't need 
a turbine, right? What would I do with a turbine? I'd cut my hand off with it, right? It's no good to me. I don't need it. I don't need a, a million dollars if I wanted to go research. Even something kind of convoluted. Let's say I want to do some sort of research that takes me to several different countries. And I need, you know, housing costs. I need room and board. I need all that stuff. You're still not even, you probably haven't even broke like $50,000 for like a, a multi-year project. And that's one of the great assets of the humanities. It's in the mind. You don't need experiments. You don't need to build this fancy you know, contraption and say, oh, well, I was wrong. Sorry about that. Can I get a new grant? <laughs> oh, I'll do it better this time. And that's, that's probably just the nature of the game you're playing because you don't need that. But what you do need is you do need some funding and you need people who are interested because it is about people. You know, professors need students. They need an audience. And I remember when I was looking at this sort of thing, there's a very high supply of history PhDs in comparison with the amount of professorships open. And that's very bad news for anyone interested in pursuing this path. And you could say, is, is that a funding issue? Should the government fund um, Asian studies more? I mean, from a biased perspective, I would say yes. It doesn't cost a lot and you get a good, good amount of your money for it. But at the same time, they would say, well, if there aren't enough students for the amount of professors, you know, should there be more professorships open if students want to take these classes? It's just the markets. Yeah, you know, people don't care, <laughs> which goes back to how do you make them care? And the thing I don't like about the punch card is you're sort of, it, it takes the, the lectures to be the burden, right? So you need three out of five. Oh God, I'll go like sleep or I'll, I'll like play a phone game. I'll listen to this person drone on and on and on about something I don't care about. So I can go see Lady Gaga, ooh, you know? So I, I like the idea in a sense, you know, reach out to connect the mainstream with this sort of niche interest, you know, bring it to the public consciousness. But I don't think that particular method would work very well. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just thinking a little bit more about uh, funding and then leaning into, you know, our, our uh, a, a little bit bigger of a, of a topic, you know, is I remember I was listening to a uh, lecture one time and uh, he studies, you know, uh, Russia and East Europe and stuff like that. And he, he, he was he was basically saying like, you know, man, when I was getting my PhD, um, you know, the Russian studies department, we, man, we were getting money from the department of defense, department of education, you know, all these different national security think tanks and stuff like that. And he was staggered because it's like, man, you know, it, nowadays, you know, if you, if you want to look at this from like a very, um, you know, cold war, uh, us perspective, you know, he was like, you know, China is the, is the greatest threat to the U.S. in the 21st century, but yet it's not getting that same level of funding from the DOD and, you know, national security think tanks. And so, you know, I, I guess uh, le asking this question while leaning into the next topic, I, I mean, should we be getting uh, more funding from those places? And of course, that's going to come with the caveat of like, okay, well, they're going to want to, they're going to want us to write research that frames U.S.-China relations in a very Cold War framework. And, and so it's like, should we be getting that funding? Is it a good thing that we're framing the research that way? And, you know, you know people, uh, again, thinking in popular conversation, think about will the U.S. and China go to war within the next 10 years? If we go off and write this research that the DOD would be funding us, are we just writing a self-fulfilling prophecy? First, a, a disclaimer. My initial foray into Chinese was funded by the Department of Defense. Have you ever heard of the Star Talk program? Uh, no. What, what's that? It was, this is the sort of outreach program we've been talking about. It's funded by the state's military interests. The Star Talk program was a, was a language teaching program, a language and cultural immersion thing, funded by the Department of Defense. And they wanted people to learn critical security languages is how, how they phrased it. And so what counted? You know, Urdu counted, Chinese counted, um, Russian counted, Arabic. Were different, you know, there were different options in different areas depending on the interests available. I'm not, I'm not too sure how they made the decisions. But where I lived, um, so Glastonbury, Connecticut, 
there was Chinese. And then later they added Russian and they added Arabic for a year. And that was my first foray into Chinese. I, I thought it was great. It was this government funded thing. It was like, first, you didn't have to pay the first year. It was free. It was like a hundred bucks the second year. And it was, you know, it was great. You went to Chinatown, you learned Chinese. You know, it was fun. And that's, that's honestly how I got started with this. And so when I, when I talk about these sorts of things, I always think about what are the, what do people want you to do with this? Why are they funding it? And what do they, th you know, what, what's the point? What's in it for them exactly? And so I guess out of the Star Talk program, the, the DOD was hoping to get people who would speak foreign languages that they could call upon in times of emergency or just generally saying, we need to know what's going on. And so we just want to generally increase the pool. We don't necessarily want them all to go into, you know, we don't need these people to all go into intelligence services. We don't need them to go into the military. We don't even need them to become military contractors or politicians. But if we increase the pool, there's no disadvantage. It's just, it's a, not a lot of money for what you get out of it. Even if, let's say only 5% of the people who go in become proficient at a high degree or something like that. But it also reminds me of a conversation I had with, I guess it wasn't really a conversation, it was an exchange with a classmate during a seminar at UO. And it went something like this. We were talking about funding and, you know, I think it was Professor Goodman was talking about, you know, so, you know, do you know how you apply for funding? How, how do you get funding? Why do you think projects get funded and others don't? <laughs> You know, trying to get all of us, you know, little wannabe scholars to think about these sorts of, you know, relevant things. <laughs> and um, someone was saying that he had applied for funding from the Japanese government. And there was no issue. There was no censorship because I, I think I had insinuated that they would censor whatever he wanted to write or something. And so my response to that was, well, there was no need for them to censor what you wrote because they liked what you're going to write, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, there's no need for it. They already they looked at your project. They said, "Perfect, this is exactly what we want." There's no need for the heavy hand in that sort of circumstance. That's also what I think about with the sort of DOD funding. Of course, they're going to look for things they like. That's how funding works. And so, of course, they're, it's going to influence what sort of research is done. It's going to be, tell me about the People's Liberation Army and their capabilities in tropical environments. Tell me about the history of the People's Navy. Or tell me about water tables, you know, how could we use China's water crisis to our advantage, you know, these sorts of sort of cynical topics. And it's understandable, right? So that's what, that's what the intelligence services, what the military does, right? That's the sort of research they like and that's, that's useful to their planning. Even if, you know, they, they wrote a plan to invade Canada, they're not going to do it. But there's a plan for everything. That's what they do. And so, of course, it would influence what's done. But at the same time, I feel like this Cold War comparison is, it, it gets more and more dangerous, I think, by the year. Because there's something very different about the Cold War to what we have today. But, but you, you would agree that people are, are very much framing it in a Cold War sense, oh, in popular conversations. Of theory. course, of yeah. course. It's very hard to ignore. And you shouldn't ignore it because, you know, you shouldn't ignore things around you generally. But what I mean by that is you know, the Soviet Union was a self-contained entity. The Soviet Union did not trade with the United States. The United States did not trade with the Soviet Union. China and the United States are dependent on one another. And this whole Cold War saber-rattling thing is much more dangerous because of that. It's more like, and this is a comparison I remember I read a long time ago, but I think it's sort of frighteningly relevant. The relationship between the United Kingdom and Germany before the First World War. The United Kingdom did lots of trade with Germany. They bought lots of things from German factories. And Germany was a growing and growing threat and resented, you know, the haughty United Kingdom and all that sort of thing. And so that's a, that's a much more dangerous issue. The Cold War was a staring contest with proxy wars. It was bad, but it didn't, it didn't lead to full out war between the Soviet Union and the United States. But the First World War was a different story. I don't know. What do you think about funding? And does it necessarily steer scholarship 
into a certain direction? And what are the moral obligations of the scholar in choosing funding? You know, it is, it is one of those unfortunate things where it's like, okay, you know, um, you know, depending on who is giving you the money, you do need to, uh, you know, you do need to keep in mind what their motivations are, why they gave you the money. And, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of times the people who give you the money are, at least in my experience, they're, um, they're not going to look with, with a, with a hard microscope at what it is that you're writing. And so you still can get away with writing things that maybe they're not, uh, super enthusiastic about you, you know, uh, saying and, and, and researching. And so there is still some flexibility in that sense. And I, I, I would, I think this is tricky, but, but I, I would say <clears throat> because Asian studies is currently in a position where the general public isn't throwing money at us the way that the general public is, is making donations to scientific institutions, uh, we, we need this funding. We need DOD funding. You know, we need funding from national security think tanks because right now no one, no one's giving it to us. And, and here's also the thing, right? Um, right now, the funding situation in the U.S. is such that um, sometimes your only option is to turn to the, the Chinese Scholarship Council because sometimes they're the only game in town who's willing to offer you money because the, the, the funding, especially now, is so scarce. Um, there's very few places that offer you money that's worthwhile making a scholarship for. Like there, there's, there's institutions that are willing to give you like $500 scholarships, but it's like, man, do I really need, wanna waste, you know, 10 hours of my day writing this application essay and doing all this stuff to submit it just for 500 bucks? Or can I spend that same amount of time, you know, submitting something to the CSC that's going to get me, you know, thousands of dollars in, in scholarship funding. And so, you know, if the U.S. government is concerned about, oh, man, there's all these scholars who are taking money from the Chinese government and uh, we're worried then about how their work might be censored. I do think the U.S. government increasingly does have that fear, but they're unwilling to fund Asian studies scholars at the same time. Or maybe they're not able to. I, I really don't know. Well, but, this goes a little bit into, just to interject briefly, Yeah, this goes a little bit into the special distrust on funding that comes from China. Because mm -hmm. I remember when, when we were in the seminar, the same one I was talking about earlier, talking about funding. One of the central points we were discussing is, why is it that funding from you know, a state-funded organization in Korea, or Japan, or Germany for that matter, doesn't attract the same level of suspicion? There's something unique about funding from China. I think I think a lot of people get the impression that their the intentions of the Chinese are always nefarious, and and so it it, har it creates that suspicion that oh well I, I don't know if I can trust this research that you wrote because it was funded in large part by Chinese money. That's that's not necessarily the case, and so you know part of that just goes to teaching people critical thinking skills you know, reading between the lines of a person's research, which I, I think is something that's, that's greatly lacking in our educational institutions today. But um, um, yeah, I, I think I sort of lost track of what your original question was, but, but um, yeah, essentially I, I would say that I agree with the idea that the DOD should fund us more. Will that necessarily result in us creating a bunch of Cold War research that's just going to create this self-fulfilling prophecy of war with China? Maybe it'll produce some of that, but I also think that it's going to produce a lot of really fruitful research on areas of China that can create more productive relationships between the two countries. Because I think that there's a lot of scholars, it's like, most historians of China have friends in China and some, you know, some people are, are, are dating uh, people who live in China or, or, you know, some people have family who's in China. So it's like a lot of us scholars of China, we, most of us don't really think in this Cold War context, you know, because we, we have friends over there. So I, I feel like most of us, if we got this DOD funding, I mean, some of us would probably write propaganda research, but I think a lot of us would 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 create genuine scholarship that would that would help 
uh, you know, foster better relations between the two countries. Well, I think one thing to point out is it's not necessarily the work you do, it's how others use it. But you can't really control for that, really. Uh, one thing I think that is significant is that you should always look at where your funding comes from. And you should consider the politics of it, because that's what it is really in the end. What will people say if I take this funding because of, it was funded by Mexico or something, I don't know. It was funded by Canada, you know, the nefarious Canadians have this ploy to take over American academia or something. And so they offer you big, big money to write favorably about Canada. And, you know, that sort of thing I would say you should not take, because in that case, that's, you're, you're writing their own, you're a ghost writer for a Canadian propaganda project. And so in that sense, I think the, your scholarly ethics, right, your independence as a researcher is directly threatened. So no, you should not take that. But with these general scholarships, there, there is no, as we were talking about, there is no such stipulation, right? It's just, we look at your project and we like what it is and therefore we'll fund it, we'll provide some funding for you. And of course, that goes into what we were talking about earlier with, well, of course, it fits into their, into some sort of department narrative somehow if they want to fund it, but you know, it doesn't affect your independence as a scholar. And I think that's the big, that's the big distinction between those two scenarios. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, to, to, to top off our conversation here, I want to, I, uh, I guess, ask an easy question, uh, which is something that we've been alluding to here is like, in popular conversation, people have asked, is the US and China going to go to war? It's a really easy question. And I think you can just answer it in like a minute, because it's just, we, we, we could resolve it right here today. Uh, so, so go ahead and, and give us the, the clean answer that's going to resolve this conversation once and for all. Oh, the clean, definitive, final answer. Yeah. Oh, well, of course, we all know that, you know, <laughs> geopolitics never changes. And, it, you know, it's always set in stone. I think the easy answer is people on both sides are agitating uh, the, the way the saber rattlers do. It's, it's good press. It's good, you know, it's good imaging. It's good posturing. And so that's, that's one thing. But does posturing actually lead to war? And it doesn't necessarily. And that's something I think people should bear in mind about this, this sort, of, sort of, you know, this I remember, um, I, th I think you put it in writing earlier, that is Taiwan the new wedge issue for this um, possible confrontation? Maybe, maybe, I don't, I don't know, I can't predict the future. But the point of the matter is posturing is posturing and war is something that is a bit more involved. So posturing is free, right? You have a diplomat go on the TV, puff out his chest and say, you Americans are belittling us Chinese and yeah, we're not gonna take it anymore. Then you have the American diplomat, oh, well, you know, the United States with its rule-based order deals favorably with all countries and we don't understand what exactly the big issue is. You're being unreasonable. You know, these are international waters, so on and so forth. And it's a posturing thing. And so that's free. You do as much of that as you want. To send a battleship and fire upon something, <laughs> you know, put boats on the ground, drones, that's something a bit more involved. And my simple answer is I don't think it will happen with... But how, how would I know? I don't know. The CIA maybe knows. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I guess I would say that, that, that I don't have the answer either, but, um, you know, I, I, I guess I kind of, I, I worry, you know, um, you know, of course, you, you and I uh, both have uh, many, many connections with, with people in China. And so, I'm sure it's something that, that you worried about. And it's something that I worry about too, because, um, you know, yeah, yes, there's, there's a lot of uh, posturing and, 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 you know, I'm not saying all people in the US are, are like this. I, I think it's a very small- There's always individuals. There, there's a small vocal minority that uh, I increasingly hear beating the war drums and they say like, oh, well, we need to defend Taiwan. And, and you know, look, I think, I think you and I both agree that, um, you know, well, I, I guess I won't speak for you, but I'll say, I, I, think, I think Taiwan's sovereignty is important, but- um, I agree. 
yeah. I also have people I know in Taiwan, so I'm a bit biased in that direction. Yeah, but I, I hear a lot of people saying, "Well, we need to defend Taiwan, and we need to we need to blow the first strike against China." And you know, part part of me wonders, it's like, okay, well, how much do you do you actually know about Taiwan? How much do you actually know about its history? Like, how much of this is like a genuine um, care for the sovereignty of Taiwan, and how much of it is just okay, well, the, the war in Afghanistan is over. The war in Iraq is effectively over. The U.S. is now beginning to turn its gaze to the next uh, you know, public enemy, number one. And obviously the very easy target is China. You know, the, the Russia, Russia is still you know, an international issue, but sort of the Russia chapter in, in U.S. history is over. And so people are like, okay, well, who's like the next bad guy we can fight? And so, so I, I kind of I worry about this conversation that I'm hearing in the US because I hear from a lot of people, like and even on Reddit, I'll go on Reddit sometimes, and, and it almost seems like people in the US are talking about it more as if, a, more like it's a when rather than an if. And it worries me because it's like, okay, well, these people, even though it's just their opinion, they're voting for people who think like them, who are then going to become congressmen and senators and whatnot. Um, and, and that, that could have serious repercussions. So I heard similar concerns expressed from someone in Hong Kong, but speaking about Chinese media saying there's a lot of beating the war drum. Mm -hmm. But once again, this, I think the big thing I want to make clear about such a conflict and why I don't think, it, I think this is just posturing. It would be a disaster. It would be. You know, really, it's no one's interests, and no one wants. I don't think anyone actually wants it. You look at the money, you look at the lives, you look at the status quo is workable, frankly. And that's one of the things that's difficult to predict about the, the way the world works. There's a lot of things that work until they don't, and so they just sort of collapse into fire. <laughs> and so, how, how do you know what really happens? But people who say when, or people who think that this is something that should happen, or a you know, preemptive strike. I would caution them to think about what that actually means in the short term and the long term. What does it actually mean to go to war with a large power? Think about it on both sides. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for your life? And what does that mean for those around you? I don't think a lot of people, when they say this, well, frankly, I think a lot of them are bots just adding to the posturing. You, know, you can buy opinions on Reddit. You can buy opinions on Twitter. And so I, I don't take much of it seriously. But to the people in Congress posturing, to the people in the CPC, con, you know, posturing, the people writing for the tabloids on either side, just take a time when you see these sorts of inflammatory pains to actually think about the ramifications of what they're talking about. Yeah. I, I guess just to, before we wrap up, just to, just to think about this a little bit more, like right, right now, uh, the Taiwan issue uh, it, it seems like it's a pretty, uh, like there's bipartisan agreement on it, but of course, uh, we're, we're coming into an election season. Uh, do you think that this is something that will become, uh, a partisan, like one party will, uh, sort of say yes to, we need to defend them and the other won't like, do, do you, do you see it becoming like, like, uh, um, something that will be brought up in the presidential debates as like, uh, as a prime issue? Honestly, I see a different alternative that's probably, it's a bit more consistent than that. I don't see this becoming a partisan issue. I see this being a bipartisan issue more like Israel than being a, you know, let's say blue loves Taiwan, red doesn't like Taiwan, or red loves Taiwan, blue doesn't like Taiwan. I see it more of a, a political, you know, a poker chip, right? Both parties will say, we are fully in support of our allies in the Asia Pacific region. Remember, Japan is concerned about China and the East China Sea. And they see Taiwan as a critical link in, I mean, in the first island chain. And so this is not just the United States that's concerned, obviously. And it's, if that's one reason why I don't think this is a partisan issue in the making. I think the, the security apparatus and the security interest of the United States dictates that Taiwan will be a, a bipartisan issue of supports. Now, there might be different so solutions framed, but I don't see it being 
on party lines necessarily. Yeah. Well, cool, Tom. I, I think I think we've solved all the problems of the world here. Uh, I think, I we think have. everyone can rest assured that uh, everything is going to be okay now because we we've just answered all the world's problems. And goodbye to twenty twenty one. Hello to twenty twenty two. It's going to be a rosy year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Tom, thanks for coming on uh, this episode once again of the What Is Asia podcast. Thanks for having me back. It's always good to be here. And for those who want to see more content, you can go to the What Is Asia podcast YouTube channel or nakotadefonso.com. We'll see you in the next episode.